I'm Deirdre Bolton. Thanks for streaming with us. In today's update, new this morning, Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg turning himself into authorities as prosecutors here in New York are expected to file tax fraud charges against him and the organization. In a statement, the Trump Organization accused prosecutors of using Weisselberg as a pawn. We will have updates on this developing story throughout the day. And scorching temperatures are breaking records all over the U.S. Conditions so dry that fireworks are banned in major western cities from Seattle down to Los Angeles. This as the holiday weekend travel crush is already in full force. Today expected to be the busiest day on the roads. Almost 50 million Americans expected to get behind the wheel. And overnight, a massive fireworks explosion rocked an L.A. neighborhood, injuring at least 17. The LAPD bomb squad called in to safely detonate 5,000 pounds of illegal fireworks. Find out what went wrong. But we begin with a special grand jury bringing an indictment against the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer. CFO Alan Weisselberg surrendering himself to authorities in New York this morning as charges are expected to be unsealed this afternoon. Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has the latest. This morning, after a two-year investigation into Donald Trump's business dealings, the first criminal charges against his company have been filed and are now just hours away from being revealed in court. Sources briefed on the investigation tell ABC News that charges against the Trump Organization and its longtime chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, include tax fraud. Weisselberger has worked for the company since the 1970s. In one of his old books, Trump said of Weisselberg, quote, he did whatever was necessary to protect the bottom line. Replacing George this week is my chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg. And you think George is tough? Wait you see Alan. Sources briefed on the investigation say the company and Weisselberg are accused of avoiding taxes on fringe benefits, including cars, school tuition, and rent-free apartments. The charges come after the Manhattan District Attorney obtained Trump's tax returns and other financial records in a battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Trump has long insisted he runs a clean company and that the investigation is politically motivated. The continuation of the greatest and most disgusting witch hunt of all time. Weisselberg is the most important person in the Trump organization who is not a member of the Trump family. The big question now is whether prosecutors can get him to testify against Donald Trump. Deidre? Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl, thank you. The Trump organization has released a statement saying Alan Weisselberg is a loving and devoted husband, father, and grandfather who has worked at the Trump organization for 48 years. He is now being used by the Manhattan District Attorney as a pawn in a scorched earth attempt to harm the former president. The district attorney is bringing a criminal prosecution involving employee benefits that neither the IRS nor any other district attorney would ever think of bringing. This is not justice. This is politics. Former President Trump not expected to be part of these criminal charges, but the investigations being conducted in New York have gone far deeper than any initial indictments might have indicated. With us now, law professor and former federal prosecutor Jessica Roth and ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Katersky for more on the legal and political implications for Trump. Welcome to you both. Jessica, starting with you, how significant are these indictments? I mean, they are criminal. Yeah, it's not every day that you see an indictment against a corporation. It's not unprecedented, but it's certainly not every day, and certainly not against a corporation so closely associated with a former president of the United States, and one that's frankly gone up and back to the United States Supreme Court multiple times. Um, so it's a significant day. How serious it is in terms of the impact on the company, uh, we need to wait and see what the charges are and how they are framed, including what's alleged about who was involved, um, what the nature of the conduct was, how pervasive it was, uh, and for how long standing. It was. But clearly, it's not going to be a good day for the Trump organization. So, Aaron, picking up on that, the big question in this case has always been whether Weisselberg will cut a deal and testify against the former president. How likely is that? And what information could he provide? Weisselberg has worked for the Trumps since the 1970s, going back to when Fred Trump, uh, Donald Trump's father, ran the family real estate firm. He is long thought to be a, a loyal lieutenant of the former president's. But when you are facing criminal charges and you have kids and grandkids, as the statement put out from the Trump organization indicated, you wonder whether all of this pressure could perhaps turn you from loyal foot soldier into cooperating witness. 
prosecutors would undoubtedly like Weisselberg to cut some kind of a deal in order to help them navigate the finances of the Trump organization. And there may be no one else but Alan Weisselberg who has such a window, given how deep his connections to the former president are. So speaking of family, Jessica, back to you. How are prosecutors going to put pressure on Weisselberg to cut a deal? Well, simply the bringing of the charges, the reality of criminal charges being filed, really changes the way a person thinks about whether or not to cooperate. Certainly, it's something they would be thinking about in anticipation of the possibility of charges being filed. So this will not be the first time that Weisselberg will be discussing this idea of possibly cooperating with his attorneys. But the reality of charges being filed um, and the real consequences of that, I think, really changes how someone might well think about what's in their best interest and the interest of their family. But again, we need to wait and see how the charges charges are framed, um, what the time frame is of them, what the penalties are that are attached, um, and then that will uh, impact um, how Weisselberg thinks about what's in his best interests. So, Aaron, staying on this family theme, what do these charges tell you about what could be next for the former president and his family members? At this stage, we believe this is just a first strike. The prosecutors may be building up a case using Weisselberg, using the company itself to eventually get to the former president or perhaps his children or, or other executives. And we don't know for sure. Once these charges are unsealed, we may have a better idea. But we believe they are focused on certain fringe benefits and other kinds of perks paid to executives, including Weisselberg. Things like you heard John Carl talk about. Things like school tuition and, uh, and cars and rent-free apartments. And the question is whether the requisite taxes were properly paid. But remember, Deirdre, these are prosecutors. These are not accountants. They're not just looking for irregularities. They're looking for systemic, sustained fraud in significant amounts in order to make it worthy of bringing criminal charges. So this may only be the beginning. And it's not expected that any of this today is going to include what started this investigation in the first place, and that's hush money paid to Stormy Daniels, the adult film actress who had accused uh, the, the president of a long-denied affair and, and was paid off so she didn't talk about it during the 2016 campaign. That uh, payment was arranged by Michael Cohen, who at the time was a, a lawyer and a fixer for the former president. And, and then he testified before Congress talking about the way uh, Donald Trump valued his, his assets when he was talking to tax authorities and maybe how he valued them differently when he was talking to banks to obtain loans. So all of that is still ripe for the district attorney as they, they work through eight years' worth of tax returns that he fought to the Supreme Court twice to get his hands on. Yeah, that's all good points. Uh, Jessica, attorneys for the former president say he is being targeted over politics. Of course, Aaron just reminding us of how Michael Cohen went to jail. Companies are almost never charged over employee compensation or fringe of benefits. That is the statement. Do they have a point with that? I can't speak to whether there's precedent uh, for charging companies um, over fringe benefits. I'm just not aware of what the history is there. Um, but if the evidence is not there, then the charges can't be brought. If the evidence is there, um, then the charges can be brought, subject to considerations uh, that are discretionary about whether it's appropriate to charge a corporation under the circumstances. And that includes things like the history of the company, um, the seriousness of the conduct, and how important it, prosecutors think it is to bring charges against the company if they perceive, for example, that it's a danger to the community. Um, so, as I said, I can't speak to whether there's precedent for this particular type of charges, but it ultimately depends on the evidence and whether it's there um, and these discretionary decisions um, about the company, none of which would involve politics. Thank you so much, Jessica Roth, Aaron Kurtevsky. Thank you, thank you. Stay with ABC News Live all day for live coverage of the indictment of Alan Weisselberg and the Trump Organization. Well, this July 4th weekend, more Americans are expected to be on the move than we have seen since the pandemic began. But airlines are still canceling dozens of flights per day. ABC transportation correspondent Gio Benitez is at Newark Airport with the latest. This morning, the travel rush is officially on with an estimated 47 million people beginning their 4th of July journeys across America and beyond. 3.5 million are expected to fly this weekend. United CEO Scott Kirby telling us the busiest day so far for air travel could be today. July 1st is going to be the busiest day since COVID started, but it'll only have that record for four days because July 5th is going to break it. But not without frustration at airports and on the roads. American and Southwest are still canceling dozens 
dozens of flights per day. American with a pilot shortage, Southwest blames the weather. And while TSA insists it's ready, a warning from the TSA union head. Because of the fact that, you know, there are shortage in staffing, you know, there are going to be long lines. Just be patient. Even airport parking is running low. New York area airports now asking travelers to reserve a spot online. And across the country, reports of people looking for parking for hours and missing their flights. We're expecting Chicago O'Hare to be the busiest airport this weekend. It'll have about 403,000 departing seats, which is nearly 100,000 more departing seats than the next two busiest airports, which are LAX in Los Angeles and Dallas-Fort Worth. And the busiest time for airports tomorrow, specifically between 7 and 8 a.m. Eastern. But what if you're one of the 44 million expected to hit the road this weekend? Well, you better start driving. Gas Buddy is telling us that the worst traffic will be this afternoon and tomorrow between 3 and 6 p.m. Cities like Atlanta, Boston, San Francisco may see three, four, even five times as much traffic as they typically see on any given day. So, Deirdre, it is going to be extremely busy. Joe Benitez, thank you very much. And as everyone is looking ahead to the holiday weekend, Americans across the country hoping to avoid drenching rains and thunderstorms slamming states overnight. Take a look at lightning striking right outside of Yankee Stadium last night and many out west looking for some relief from the deadly record-breaking heat wave. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z in Seattle tracking it all for us. Good morning, Ginger. Deidre, while it's a cloudy and cool morning here around Seattle, you can see it right behind me there. We just got those new numbers in from that unprecedented heat wave. At least 76 people died, and that is stateside. In Canada, it could be nearly 100. And on top of all of that, Oregon has issued a state of emergency for wildfires. We saw wildfires in Canada out of our window as we flew into Seattle. So there's also a new fire just south of Mount Shasta. Of course, we had the lava, which I'll tell you about. But this one is the Salt Fire. Uh, they've got about 1,000 acres there, no containment. And there were those new evacuations and then the evacuations that have expanded throughout the week in the lava fire. Uh, that one now exploded to more than 17,500 acres, still at 19% containment. Let me take you to what's going to happen as far as the temperatures, because you see the big high. That was the problem. It's over Alberta and Saskatchewan now bringing the heat to interior. So Rockies, uh, northern Rockies like Spokane, still 98 there. Uh, 97 Helena, 102 for Boise today. Look at Billings. will be around 99. That's not going to go down the next couple days either as we go into the weekend. So still many states on alert for that. And also the dry lightning that can come with some of the storms and the gusty winds. That's making for those red flag warnings, which will likely expand. On the east coast, the front that broke up all that record heat because we saw it well, 102 at Newark for the second day in a row. That brought the 60 to 70 mile per hour wind. So the damaging wind was 160 some reports from Maine back to Virginia. It wasn't just in Dutchess County, but look, that's from Middletown, Pennsylvania. So lots of tree limbs down, waking up this morning, cleaning up, and there will be more lingering showers behind all of this. There's still flash flood threats from New Mexico into Missouri. I feel like those have been there for uh, three, four days now. Down in the Ohio River Valley, over to New Jersey. So again, anything that falls could fall in the order of one to three inches super quickly. And that's why we'll keep those threats up at least through today uh, for most to that stretch. Ginger Z in Seattle for us. Thank you. And the fallout continues after Bill Cosby was released from prison yesterday after his sex assault conviction was overturned due to a technicality. Cosby returned to his home outside of Philadelphia in the afternoon following a ruling by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Lindsay Davis has been covering the story from the start. She has the latest. This morning, Bill Cosby is officially a free man, following a ruling by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturning his conviction for sexual assault. The comedian telling me in a phone conversation about his disappointment with some of the coverage. Nobody had the sense to say, wait one second. This doesn't match up with the truth. This is not what I was taught in college. This is not what I was taught at home. Cosby then came out with a statement maintaining his innocence, thanking fans, supporters, and friends. The 83-year-old now back at home flashing a peace sign to the cameras. What we saw today was just... The legendary comedian previously found guilty and sentenced to prison in 2018, accused of drugging and sexually assaulting Temple University employee Andrea Constand. But the Pennsylvania Supreme Court reversing that decision Wednesday because of an agreement his legal team had struck with a former prosecutor that he would not be charged if he agreed to testify in a 2005 civil suit brought by Constant. The court says Cosby will not be retried on the same charges, and that decision is, of course, sparking reaction on both sides. Felicia Rashad, who portrayed his television wife, Claire Huxtable, celebrating the news, writing on Instagram, finally, a terrible wrong is being righted. A miscarriage of justice is being corrected. 
While Cosby always maintained his innocence, he was dogged by accusations of drugging and sexually assaulting dozens of women, which he has also denied. Now, for many of Cosby's accusers, anger and frustration. Constan releasing a statement calling the decision disappointing and saying it may discourage those who seek justice for sexual assault in the criminal justice system. That sentiment is shared by Lisa Lott Lublin, who testified against Cosby, accusing him of drugging and sexually assaulting her in 1989. He cannot take back his lifestyle that he had previously of being this America's dad. That is gone forever. One legal analyst that we spoke to put it this way. She said that sometimes legal law and moral law don't always coincide. The Cosby district attorney released a statement saying that Cosby is free on a procedural issue that is irrelevant to the facts of the crime. Deidre. Lindsay Davis, thank you very much. Joining us now for more on this is the host and legal analyst at Law and Crime Network, Terry Austin. Terry, thanks so much for lending us your expertise. How is this all happening on a technicality? Well, it's a procedural decision here. It's not a substance decision. But I do think that it was the right decision, not the right result, though. So the conviction was vacated because they actually used the poison fruit from that tree that they should not have gotten. So in other words, they used the testimony that Bill Cosby made at this deposition when, in fact, he was promised it would not be used against him. So he gave up his Fifth Amendment right. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that was a violation of due process. So that was the right decision. I think, though, that the dissent got the result and the remedy right, because what the Supreme Court could have done here was to say, vacate the decision, don't use the fruit from the poison tree, but allow the claim to be brought again. What they essentially did is to say, forever, this claim cannot be brought against Bill Cosby. And that really isn't the intention of a prosecutorial agreement. It should be just for the agreement between that prosecutor and that defendant, not forever. It's not a pardon. So I think the court was partially right and partially wrong. OK, partially right, partially wrong. Were you surprised that he was let out of prison? Well, with the decision to vacate the conviction, that would be the next step for him to get out of prison. And so I think that was correct, that he had already served three of the 10 years. And in fact, he was denied parole very recently because he failed to go to a sexual assault program. But the court just decided, obviously, that it was a wrong conviction, that the charges should never have been brought, Deirdre. That's essentially what they said, that the case should never have been brought. They didn't say that the jury came to the wrong decision from a substance standpoint. They said from a procedural standpoint, the charges should not have been brought, and so therefore Bill Cosby should be let out of jail. So Terry, what about the future of this case? I mean, can it be appealed? What are the next most logical steps? The next logical step would be an appeal to the Supreme Court. I don't think that that will occur. I don't think the prosecution is going to try to get that remedy. And I don't think that the Supreme Court of the United States is going to take up this case. It's a criminal matter. It's something I think that the Supreme Court justices will decide is better left with the state to determine how it should be resolved. So I don't think that we'll see anything further, at least as far as the prosecution is concerned. I do think that the other victims might try to bring cases if they're not time barred. Okay, so that was my next question. And speaking of next steps, there's Andrea Constant. There is another woman singular with claims against Bill Cosby and then numerous others, but they have been beyond the statute of limitations. So what are their choices collectively? You know, I think the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement, which assists individuals in terms of bringing cases against people who have victimized them, I think those cases will proceed. Andrea Constan, her case went forward because she wasn't time barred. There was no statute of limitations. Many of the other cases have been time barred. But if, in fact, there is a case against Bill Cosby or anyone else for that matter, and it's not time barred, the statute hasn't run, they will be able to bring their cases. One other thing I'll mention is I think from a prosecution standpoint, those prosecutors will have to think carefully about which cases they bring on behalf of the victims and what the evidence shows, just to make sure that at the end of the day, they have a conviction. Terry, thank you. Terry Austin with us there.
President Biden and the First Lady set to visit Surfside, Florida this morning after that deadly building collapse. Rescue crews working tirelessly around the clock. 18 people have now been confirmed dead. 145 is still unaccounted for. Victor, Victor Okendo in Surfside with more. Exactly one week after the devastating collapse, overnight the heartbreaking update. Four more bodies pulled from the rubble. It is with great sorrow real pain that I have to share with you that two of these were children aged four and ten. The two identified as Lucia and her younger sister Emma. Their parents Marcus Guara and his wife Anna have been identified too. The death toll now at 18 and 145 are still unaccounted for. Search crews doing everything they can to find them. We find every day new spaces, new tunnels that we can, that can penetrate into the site. This gut-wrenching moment, a firefighter telling our Miami station WPLG that shortly after the collapse, they heard thumping on a wall and a woman saying, I'm here, get me out. He later learned she did not survive. This new video shot by Adriana Sarmiento just seven minutes before the collapse, capturing water gushing into the garage below the building, as well as debris on the ground. Weight builds up as you come down the tower. So those columns on the first floor are essentially supporting the entire tower. And this haunting voicemail recorded the moment Risa Rodriguez saw the pancake building. Oh! She's now suing the condo association, saying she's voiced concerns multiple times about leaks in the garage. Police telling ABC News search and rescue crews heard cracks in the Champlain Tower South in the middle of the night, pausing operations. A reminder that the part of the building that is still standing is unstable. Deirdre? Victor Okendo in Surfside, Florida. Thank you. Reunited, Prince Harry, Prince William back together again today to honor their mother, Princess Diana, on what would have been her 60th birthday. We'll give you a closer look. Plus, the very latest on the battle over Britney, why a judge denied a request to remove her father from her conservatorship and what it means for the pop star going forward. Stay with us. A bit of breaking news. We have a new statement from the Trump Organization CFO, Alan Weisselberg, after he surrendered himself to authorities in New York this morning. It reads, Mr. Weisselberg intends to plead not guilty and will fight these charges in court. We expect the grand jury indictment against Weisselberg and the Trump Organization to be unsealed this afternoon. In the meantime, Prince Harry and Prince William are reuniting to unveil a statue honoring their late mother, Princess Diana, on what would have been her 60th birthday. The brothers will unveil the statue of Diana at her former home in Kensington Palace, where they grew up. Maggie Rooley is there with the details. This morning, Prince Harry's back on British soil, reuniting with his brother, Prince William, both here to honor their beloved mother, Princess Diana, on what would have been her 60th birthday. Her boys unveiling a much-anticipated statue at her former home, Kensington Palace, where the pair grew up. I think this statue is hugely significant because it is a definitive tribute from her sons, from William and Harry. It's their shared vision of how they want her to be seen and how they want her to be remembered. In a small, personal event with just close family, invited no royal fanfare or wives the world watched diana raise her boys she was a hands-on mom and the world grieved with them when she passed william just 15 harry 12 united then but now a rift between them harry claiming jealousy drove him and megan from the royal fold but according to royal author robert lacy william threw harry out after an explosive argument over whether megan was mistreating staff william never publicly addressing the row the two last seen together standing apart as they honored their grandfather, Prince Philip, during his funeral just two months ago. Today, their brotherhood is under the spotlight once again. I think there's been a lot of hope that an event like this would bring the brothers back together. And it's certainly true that their mother's memory and honoring her memory is pretty much one of the only things that really unites them right now. And Deirdre, we know the brothers have been working on this memorial for years. It is something that has just been so important to both of them. And hopefully today that's what everyone will focus on, this shared love the two of them have for their mother. And who knows, maybe it'll be enough to bring the two of them closer together again. Deirdre? Maggie Rooley in London, thank you. For a look at the day's science and technology headlines, here's Andrew Dimber.
In today's Tech Bytes, changes coming to Instagram. The head of the app posting a message saying Instagram is looking to focus more on video and entertainment after seeing the success of competitors like TikTok and YouTube. Upcoming changes are expected in the next few months. Spotify is reportedly thinking about venturing into ticketed events. Selling tickets to both live and virtual concerts may be a way for the company to set itself apart from Apple Music. The expansion is reportedly aimed at improving Spotify's relationships with artists. WhatsApp Android users will soon be able to make photos and videos disappear. The new feature has been in the works for a while now after a growing number of users expressed concern that too much of their personal information was being stored for too long. Those are your Tech bites. Have a great day. Andrew Dimbert, thank you. Now to Britney Spears' fight and the conservatorship that she has called abusive. Overnight, we saw headlines that said Britney's request to remove her father from the situation were denied. But to be clear, what happened yesterday was the judge tying up loose ends on a matter that was decided seven months ago. Now, Jamie Spears is trying to defend himself, pass the blame, and use the court to do it. Kaylee Hartung is in L.A. with the latest. This morning as Britney Spears fights for her independence, her father's calling on the court to investigate her explosive claims. A court filing from his attorney claiming Jamie Spears is unable to hear and address his daughter's concerns directly because he has been cut off from communicating with her. It was just a week ago that the superstar spoke out in court, calling the conservatorship that's controlled her life for 13 years abusive, claiming her father loved the control to hurt his own daughter, and telling the judge, I just want my life back. Jamie Spears' latest court filing an attempt to defend himself, outlining his current role as conservator of the estate, explaining he's strictly responsible for managing Britney's finances, pointing out he's not overseen her medical and personal needs since 2019. That's when the court appointed a professional conservator, Jody Montgomery, the conservator of the person. Jamie Spears now expressing his concern that it's Montgomery who does not reflect Miss Spears' wishes. Brittany is currently on vacation in Hawaii with boyfriend Sam Asgari. In court, the mother of two said the conservatorship doesn't allow her to ride in a car driven by Asgari or make her own decisions about birth control or marriage. Attorneys for Montgomery telling ABC News in a statement she has tirelessly acted in Brittany's best interests. And during her appointment, Brittany's choice to marry and to start a family have never been impacted by the conservatorship. So, Deirdre, headlines grabbed attention overnight, saying Britney's request to remove her father from the conservatorship was denied. But to be clear, what happened yesterday was just the judge tying up some loose ends on a matter that was actually decided seven months ago. So, yes, Jamie Spears is still in charge of Britney's finances. But these dueling statements you just heard are just more evidence that this conservatorship has a lot of layers to it and a lot of competing agendas. We heard Britney's impassioned plea last week for the conservatorship to be terminated altogether. Well, now her attorney needs to file that request formally for this process to move forward. Deirdre. Kaylee Hartung, thank you very much. It is being called a total catastrophic failure. We are going to tell you how an attempt to detonate 5,000 pounds of illegal fireworks went horribly wrong. Stay with us. A bomb squad was called in after fireworks exploded in a major sting operation by the LAPD. The squad was called in to safely detonate 5,000 pounds of illegal fireworks, but it ended up injuring multiple people, including police officers. Zoreen Shah has the latest. Zoreen. Good morning, Deidre. It's been called a total catastrophic failure. The blast shook this entire area last night. 17 people were injured. The LAPD and ATF were attempting to safely destroy homemade explosives after seizing 5,000 pounds of both legal and illegal fireworks. Some were the size of soda cans, others even smaller. As spectators gathered, a fireball. The explosion tossing debris and overturning cars, even shattering windows of this laundromat across the street. This morning, officials say luckily none of the injuries are life-threatening, but just a terrifying moment for people in this neighborhood. Deirdre? Zoreen, thank you very much. And that does do it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Deirdre Bolton. Thank you for joining us. And remember, ABC News Live here for you all day with the very latest news, context, and analysis. We are waiting for another briefing on that deadly building collapse in Surfside, Florida at about 9.45 a.m. Eastern Time. We will bring that to you live as soon as it gets started. In the meantime, have a great day.